There once was a man who wanted to dig a well in his backyard. Let's call him Bill. It was the dry season, and it hadn't rained for a very long time. Bill lived on the coast of Florida, so he knew if he dug down a few feet somewhere, he'd find water. So he found a place in the back corner and started digging. Sure enough, the small hole began to collect a bit of water in the bottom. But he also started hitting pieces of hard limestone. So he decided to start another hole on the other side of the yard. This time there was no limestone, but after a few shovelfuls, he hit a huge, gnarly old pine root. Maybe he'd have better luck by the house. Well, after splitting the cable line in two, he decided to move out to the center of the yard. Eventually, one problem after another, Bill had 27 shallow holes in his backyard and no well. This is how many Christians treat the Bible. We go looking for water, truth, encouragement, challenge, peace, wisdom, and dig around like Bill in his backyard. We read a few verses here and there, occasionally finding some shallow water, but the first time there's a drought, we are left with nothing but potholes. Yeah, I know, the Bible is a big, confusing book. It's not like people have hours and hours to read and study the Bible every day. I get it. Everyone's busy. But this is God's book. And I hear it has some pretty important things to say about God, us, life, and the future. So what do we do? How do we dig a well that will draw life-giving water, even in dry seasons? Well, for that we need to switch metaphors. Here's Sue. She loves Star Wars. Her and her friends have memorized every line of every episode and occasionally get together to act out scenes together. She plays Princess Leia most of the time, but occasionally Chewbacca. One day she had an idea. Instead of just playing the same old scenes over and over again, what if they kept the story going? That's every Star Wars fan's dream, right? What happens next? What adventures could they come up with that made sense within the storyline? So what if we imagine the Bible was like a six-episode blockbuster movie? Well, for one, it would be the most watched series ever. Imagine the merchandising. Oh, wait. Well, anyway. Okay, so maybe not a movie. Let's just call it what it is, a story. But not just any story for the sake of entertainment. It's the true story of the whole world. Unfortunately, the whole idea that a story can be true and, and meaningful has almost been lost. Us modern people only think something carries weight if it can be proven, like gravity or that country music all sounds the same. We want video evidence that Jesus raised from the dead. Where's the proof? But in reality, people act out the stories they believe every day. Stories like the American dream. Or that technology is going to save the world. Even stories that sound really good. Like that family is the most important thing. But somewhere along the line, these stories fail. We lose the perfect job. Medical technology can't cure our cancer. Or our family lets us down. The truth is, we need a bigger story. Something that has roots in history and has been lived for generations by people around the world. The Bible tells such a story. The Bible shows how we can know God and trust Him. It tells us that he loves us and that he's in charge. It calls us to be his partners in the ongoing work of healing the world. And the Bible points forward to a glorious ending where all things are made new. So what would this story look like if it were told in episodes like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? Well, episode one is about creation, of course but it's also about God being in charge of the whole thing. It may be a surprise to some, but the Bible is not an 8th grade science textbook. 
It doesn't explain everything about how God created the universe. But it does say, loud and clear, that God set everything up for us to enjoy and fill the planet with his goodness. This is his kingdom, and he is the king. Now episode two goes downhill fast. A deception occurs, and humanity buys into the lie that God can't be trusted. Quickly, the story takes a dark turn. Everything good that God has set up in his kingdom in episode one is destroyed by this lack of trust and simple disobedience. As a result, humanity was destined to have root canals and wait in line at the DMV. Of course, it's a bit more serious than that, but don't lose hope. God sure didn't. Episode 3 starts out with God telling a rich pagan nomad, this guy, Abraham, that he was going to birth a nation that would save the world. There was one catch, though. He had to move from his native land to some random place that God would show him. Those were the terms. Go. Well, he went, and the rest is history. From there, episode three is one long story of the ups and downs of this nation Israel as they try to live out that promise to be world savers. It's brutally tough. They mess up a lot. Another guy, Moses, gives them some good rules to live by and leads them to their homeland. I'm not sure why he's going to beat them over the head with them, though. They get human kings, and God warns them that it's a bad idea. Some of the kings are good, like this guy, David. Others are beyond terrible. Eventually, they start worshiping other gods and probably eat too many figs or something, and they are hauled off to Babylon. Definitely not a good deal. But they eventually come back, and episode three ends with things kind of confusing. They are free again as a nation, but something isn't right. God promises through these prophet guys that one day all the kingdom promises God made will come true. Someone special, God's son, will come and work it out. Now Jesus comes on the scene, and you have to wonder what his marketing department was thinking. Born in a horse stable in a podunk town to an equally poor and podunk family. At least he had good bloodlines. Remember that good King David? But then he spends the next 30 years working as a carpenter. That's a real head-scratcher. Well, eventually God says it's time, and it's like he flips a switch. This carpenter is actually God's son. And he's here to tell Israel that all of those kingdom promises are coming true in him. He starts going to the surrounding villages and telling all the poor outcasts he can find this good news. Oh yeah, and he heals people. Casts out demons, too. And just for good measure, raises to life some dead people. Let's just say news about Jesus traveled pretty fast from there. This, of course, gets the people in charge extremely unhappy. By this time, Israel was thick with the Romans, and some kind of godly kingdom revolution was just not going to work. So eventually they set Jesus up. One of his own disciples betrays him, and they get the Romans to execute him as an enemy of the state. Seems like that's pretty much the end of the story. Jesus' followers are like, well, this completely sucks. What do we do now? But then the most unexpected thing happens. Jesus rises from the dead. He shows up real and alive, but different somehow. The disciples don't understand, but this is the future for all humanity and the world. Episode 4 ends with the resurrection, but the beginning of a new age. The rest of the Bible tells the story of how Jesus' little family of followers literally turned the world upside down. What started out looking like a failure at the cross turned into victory at the resurrection. So right off the bat, Jesus gives his followers the Holy Spirit, his literal presence on earth, to enable them to do all the stuff he did and more. They mostly helped the Jews discover Jesus first, 
but eventually that got them in trouble too, just like Jesus. So off they went throughout the surrounding countries, preaching the kingdom of God to whoever they met. One of the Jews, who had been persecuting these Jesus followers, became a Jesus follower himself in a radical way. His name was Paul. Paul became a missionary, a church planner, and one of the main authors of the New Testament letters. He literally wrote the story. Other leaders wrote books too. John, James, Peter, Luke, who was a doctor and wrote the book of Acts. These men, and women too, helped launch the greatest spiritual and cultural movement the world has ever seen. Which leads us to now. That movement is still going. People are still being captured by the good news of Jesus, that he died on the cross in our place, that his kingdom revolution is still changing the world, and that his resurrection is the promise of what is to come. The final episode, episode 6, has begun, but there is unfinished business. We are like Sue and her Star Wars friends, acting out what we know of the story in anticipation of a glorious ending. We have hints of how the story is going to end. The Bible only paints us a blurry picture that we can't quite get our minds around. It tells of a great judgment on the earth. Finally, justice to all this terrible evil will be served. But it's also filled with an enormous promise, a new heavens and a new earth, new resurrection bodies, gloriously free. It will be different, very different, but somehow familiar and real. This is God's story, the true story of the whole world. We are living out that story every day. One day, it will find a conclusion. And then maybe a new story will begin. But back to our friend Bill. He was trying to dig a well without much success. Eventually, though, he found a good place in his yard, and patiently, one shovelful at a time, the well took shape. That is how we should read the Bible. We need a good foundation, understanding the underlying story, how God has been and is today at work in the world. If you read the Bible like that, and don't give up the first time you hit a root, you'll dig a well that will give you water for the rest of your life. Thanks for listening. My name is Mike Bishop, and you can read more at my blog, whatischurch.com.